Hi everyone! In part 6 I connected up a character based LCD to my Homebrew ARM2 computer and I also showed you this other LCD screen that I used to use on my first 6502 based computer uh, a few years ago and this is a 480 by 320 LCD panel with um, uh, 262,000 colours or something like that, it's 16 bit colour and uh, yeah I used to use this on my first 6502 based computer um, I was trying to get nice graphical output and text output on it and things like that and it worked quite well. I, I seem to remember it having quite a slow interface I mean it's relatively fast given what it does but it forced me to send like 16 bits per pixel to get anything onto the screen which is quite a big ask for a 6502 and that's why I moved away from it and started looking into TV output instead but I thought it'd be good to dig this out and see if I can get it connected up to the ARM2 computer and get some graphical output onto it so since then I had a look for the datasheet. I also dug out my old 6502 code that you can see here, some of the initialization code. And in particular there's this whole bunch of uh, initialization data you need to send to the LCD to initialize the registers in the right way. Um, if you remember Ben Eater's code for the character LCD on the 6502, there were only like four registers you needed to set to make that work sensibly, but this device needs quite a lot more. And I haven't really delved into the specifics of these values. I, th I think at the time I just read through the datasheet, picked out parameters that seemed to need sensible values set on them, and uh, kind of guessed what value might be good for them. So the first thing I did was convert this to ARM assembly, which uh, you can see here, and you can see the same initialization data. And um, I wrote the program to actually send all of this over, over to the display before doing any hardware modifications, because, um, yeah, it's, like I said before, it's got a very similar interface to the other display. So it should have very similar code as well. We have the same kind of deal with a, a separate command port and a data port. Um, and generally speaking, we send one byte to the command port first, and then we send a few bytes to the data port in order to set the parameters for the command. There's also some utility functions in here as well, which again, I just kind of translated from the 6502 assembly I had before. And these are for setting a region on the screen, which we're going to write pixel data into. So you set a re so you set a range of columns and a range of rows, uh, and then after that you can send a write pixel data command, and then you just write as many pixels as you want in sequence, and it gradually fills up that region. And that's the principal way that I'm going to be using this display at the moment. Anyway, armed with this code, I went to the breadboard and started changing up the circuit. So this is just a quick clip uh, recorded on my phone. Uh, sorry for the shaky hand. Um, I'm halfway through hooking up the uh, this uh, LCD display module, um, and uh, I thought I'd show uh, how I've got this set up at the moment. Um, it's uh, pretty messy, see wires everywhere. Um, what I've done is I've taken the other LCD display module out, um, and I have uh, got the new LCD display module, the the graphical one. Um, I've connected up some rainbow ribbon cables and things to just route the pins uh, that you can see there through to the through to the breadboard and then I have the same wires I previously had hooked up to the uh, character based LCD uh, just, just providing like data to here as necessary and things like that it's all a bit of a mess one thing that is a bit different about this LCD is the uh, the actual bus interface here so you should be able to see there Going from the right hand side, there's a reset, then a chip select, then uh, a register select, then a write, and then a read signal. So the reset signal is active low just to reset the whole device from the hardware side. Chip select is active low just like the ROMs and RAMs, uh, but not like the uh, the character LCD which was which sort of had a active high enable pin. Register select is very much like the equivalent pin on the character LCD. It just chooses whether we're sending commands or data, um, roughly. Um, it's slightly different in, in terms of the API for this LCD. Um, so that one's pretty easy to hook straight through to the address bus. And then we have write and read signals. Uh, again, these are active low. It uses basically the same, um, the same kind of interface as all of these uh, standard memory chips do. Um, so for the sake of the LCD, I don't want to ever read any data from this thing. It's, it's horrifically slow at reading data. I think it quoted something like 500 milliseconds, um, or maybe maybe 500 microseconds, but either way, it's ridiculously slow uh, read cycle time, so I'm never going to read from it. So I've pinned read high, 
Um, I've also pinned chip select low and I'm just going to use the right signal uh, to control access to the device. So I'm going to take the right signal low when I want to write data to it. Register select just wires straight through to the address bus as, as on the other LCD. And reset, I've just uh, hooked up this green wire for here. Um, it's got a it's got a pull up resistor, I think, so I can I can plug that in low when I want to send a reset signal. The logic to drive that right signal um, is slightly different to the other LCD. Uh, it is active low, so it has to be inverted. It needs to be combined with the clock, and it needs to only happen during write cycles. Um, I could do it during read cycles as well, but. It, because I, I should never be sending any read cycles uh, in the direction of this device. Um, but yeah, I changed the logic here a bit. I can't remember exactly how I did it, but um, some of this stuff is wired, wired slightly differently to, to how it was with the other LCD. I also realised that I hadn't actually connected the ROM chip select signal correctly uh, in the last video. The, the, the ROM chip select should only be low when, um, when the LCD is not being addressed. Otherwise, the ROM could be outputting at the same time as the LCD device, and that's not gonna that's not gonna work well during read cycles. I'm never doing any read cycles from this LCD, as I said before. But I've hooked up a really simple uh, diode-based wire or arrangement here just to just to drive that chip select signal, just in case that mattered. A lot of this stuff was because the program I'd written wasn't working um, when I turned it on. The LCD went went white and nothing else happened, which brings back a lot of memories because that's kind of how this LCD works if you don't send it the right initialization sequences and so on. Um, but I debugged my program and I found out, I mean, I found several different bugs in the program after having written it, um, which is sort of inevitable, I guess, for um, programs of more than a certain size. Um, and having, like, no proper diagnostics here, I haven't made a um, Arduino monitor or anything like that for it, um, it's kind of hard to figure out what's wrong in these cases. Nonetheless, I spotted the bugs and um, I can now actually uh, show this working. So I'm going to turn that on. And you'll see it, it does go white to start with, but after a certain amount of time, it gets through the initialization sequence and goes black. And all I've done here is I've made it fill a rectangle of pixels with, with yellow. So, not sure how well that shows up on the camera. It's got really bad reflections, or rather, that's not reflections. That's just the the backlight not 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 showing up well on the phone. Anyway, you can see that's working. It's rather slow. Uh, my clock rate's only actually about 150 hertz here with the uh, the way I've set up the uh, the 555 based clock. Um, that's what I was measuring with the the the, the multimeter lead here. But I can actually uh, swap the capacitor there. It's just it's just a standard 555 timer. So if I pull that capacitor out, I can put a smaller one in. This one's that one was 47 microfarads. I think this one's 0.1 or something. Um, so it'll be significantly faster with this one. So that's in there now. So we turn that on. Oh, there you go. It's done already. <laughs> let's um, let's try and do that again. It's a bit hard to show on the camera. Um, I sent a reset to the CPU, but it didn't see any action. Again, that's a reset. To I think that the, the LCD needs to be reset really. So let's do that. So that's the LCD reset and showing a white screen. I'm going to reset the CPU and try and pick that pick that up as quick as I can. There we go. So you can see with a much faster clock that obviously fills the screen much more quickly. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's uh, that's where this has got to so far. Um, I've actually written a Mandelbrot plotting program now, and my next step is to get that programmed into the ROMs. So I'll give that a go and see how well it works. So I've got those uh, ROMs programmed up. Um, I put one of these uh, pulling things on that one over there because it was getting hard to get out. I'm going to have to get those on all of them because they are really a pain to get out of the breadboard like this. And having to do four every time I want to put a new program in is really quite tedious. 
Anyway, that's all programmed in. Um, I've left it on the fast uh, capacitor here, um, or the relatively fast one. I think it's only still like um, a few kilohertz, it's not very fast really. Um, so let's have a look and see what happens. Um, see how well my Mandelbrot program works. So the, the screen's cleared there. Are going to focus? Yeah, that's starting to fill from the bottom up, as it should. I'm not sure if that's actually working though. It's meant to draw a grayscale Mandelbrot. Um, Yeah, this CPU has no floating point, so um, I've done I've done this all with fixed point, with bit shifts and things like that, and it's all off the top of my head. So goodness knows if it actually works. Doesn't look like it actually works there. It is making a nice pattern though. Let's um. Let's peel the uh, cover off the screen there. And it doesn't really like focusing close up on that. So I'm seeing a lot of dithering here, which I wasn't expecting. I haven't put any code into dither, and you wouldn't expect a Mandelbrot renderer to actually doing any dithering, dithering unless you tried quite hard. There is a white line here, which should correspond to the x equals zero part uh, position, I think. Goodness me, this focus is awful. Um, so that might be why there's a white line there. As for these kind of coloured bands over here, these bands of darkness and different dithering, I have no idea what that's about. Uh, no doubt I've just got all the calculations wrong. But that's the thing with fractals, sometimes if you get the calculations wrong, it actually draws something that's interesting in other ways. So yeah, looks like some darkness is creeping in here. That's very close to the origin there. Oh, it's st it started going completely black there now. Wow, okay. Now that looks like it might actually be drawing a proper Mandelbrot up there. And it's interesting because that's that's like maybe that's positive X and positive Y. I don't know which way round up I think I've got the screen upside down to be honest. But it might be it may be that it works for some relative signs and not others, because this is sort of where I might expect the origin to be. I'm, plot I'm plotting from minus two to plus one half along the x-axis, and it's probably upside down. So that might actually be working, but only in that quadrant. Let's see if we can get a closer look at that. It does look like a Mandelbrot-like kind of thing. You can see the sort of more solid colour bands there, which is what I'd expect, um, combined with a lot of detail near the black area. But that line on the right hand side of the quadrant uh, just near the zero marker shouldn't really be there I don't think. The zero on the Mandelbrot's meant to have a big space around it but it's possible that the values near that zero line are actually uh, going into a region where my code does the wrong thing again and hence that being there. Um, that's interesting though. It does look like part of a Mandelbrot set. Just not a, It's not the whole quadrant, but this, this, this bit right down by the axis in the bottom left hand side here uh, actually looks like it's meant to. <laughs> Pretty much everything else here is wrong. Never mind. Um, I think it's interesting anyway. Um, the code probably worked better than I ought to expect it to, to be honest. It has at least filled the screen with some vaguely coherent image. At least some of it is some of it's coherent. And um, there's a, there's some nice symmetry in these bands on the right here. I'll have to debug this. Um probably not in this video. De debugging with you know four ROM chips to replace all the time is really not much fun. There's a lot more white lines. Oh wow, what's going on here? I don't think the display is very happy now. What's that about? Must be a loose connection to it. Hmm, interesting.
Oh, now it's back. I don't know why it didn't like that. Something odd going on over here with another white line there, isn't there? Anyway, that looks like that's my excuse for a Mandelbrot. And yeah, I'll debug that, um, and I guess I'll have to post another video with the working Mandelbrot when I've fixed it. So looking into what caused that uh, calculation to be incorrect, um, it turned out I had a misunderstanding about how the multiply instruction works on these ARM CPUs. Uh, I was relying on it setting a carry flag if it wrapped above a certain value. And the calculation in the Mandelbrot is essentially an iterative calculation that you run again and again and again uh, and stop if the output value is above a certain magnitude. And I, was, and I was trying to use the carry flag on the multiplication to test when it had crossed that magnitude rather than rather than having to make extra space for high bits in the fixed point representation and do compare instructions because I could get better precision out of it this way. However, ARM doesn't actually set the carry flag correctly on multiplications. It's, uh, it's listed as an undefined output. Um, so that was just wrong in the code. And, and that makes it kind of remarkable that it worked at all for any of that top left quadrant. I mean, it, may, it must just be that maybe the carry flag does work for that quadrant and not for the others or something like that. Anyway, interesting results. Um, but yeah, I had to go back to the code and rewrite it to not need that carry. So I changed the fixed point shift so that it wouldn't overflow too much and I wrote some comparison instructions and things like that into the program and basically after that I was ready to run it again and this is where we got to. So as you can see I also mounted the LCD into the breadboard instead of having it loose at the end of a long wire because I was getting tired of it dangling around and not being able to see it without holding it and things like that. So it's much much nicer like this, it's just it's all the same, it's just I've uh, wired the pins differently now. The whole thing's upside down compared to what it was before. So now it'll fill from the top to the bottom instead of the bottom to the top. And this final Mandelbrot render is actually running using a, an even faster clock frequency than I showed before. Um, I've put a very small, I've put a very small ceramic capacitor in the 555 circuit now, and this is running at about half a megahertz, I think now. It's working better, but it's not perfect. I made it coloured as well instead of grayscale here. But there's still some weird dithering going on in some of the colour bands, which really shouldn't be there on a Mandelbrot. And I think the reason for that is probably still the wrapping code I put in the integer multiplication. So what I'm doing right now is I'm performing two multiplications and an add, and then I'm testing the magnitude of the output from that to determine whether the uh, overall magnitude of the vector is too large now. However, for some input vectors, it may still be possible for that calculation to actually wrap. I may not have left enough headroom on the fixed point representation. I'll fix that, but I'm not too bothered by that right now because that's probably just a matter of adding a few more uh, tests to the code to make sure the input values were within a certain range before, before going ahead with the multiplications. And it looks quite nice anyway. The main structure of the Mandelbrot is absolutely fine here. It's, it, looks, it looks exactly as it should in terms of the shape of the inner region and things like that, so that's great. The only other thing we do still have is, as it gets to the end here, we start seeing these white lines appearing again. And I thought it was interesting that some of these white lines seem to appear in this column where there's actually quite a lot of blackness at the moment. I don't know whether that's related. And then as the, uh, as the render continues through the rest of the display it sort of gradually starts displaying more and more sort of flickery white lines until in the end you can barely see the result at all. Anyway I'm going to leave it at that for the day. It's not a perfect Mandelbot but it looks kind of nice and there are some weird bugs with the LCD that I'm not going to fix right now so yeah I'm going to leave it there. I hope that was interesting. Um, let me know what you thought. See you next time.